we continue on uh, learning of, of Saul and, and uh, David in 1 Samuel, and we're to chapter uh, 19 now. This is God's word, eternally true, beginning in 1 Samuel chapter 19, verse 1. Saul told his son Jonathan and all the attendants to kill David. But Jonathan was very fond of David and warned him. My father Saul is looking for a chance to kill you. Be on your guard tomorrow morning. Go into hiding and stay there. I will go out and st stand with my father in the field where you are. I'll speak to him about you and will tell you what I find out. Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, Let not the king do wrong to his servant David. He has not wronged you, and what he has done has benefited you greatly. He took his life in his hands when he killed the Philistine. The Lord won a great victory for all Israel, and you saw it and were glad. Why then would you do wrong to an innocent man like David by killing him for no reason? Saul listened to Jonathan and took this oath. As surely as the Lord lives, David will not be put to death. So Jonathan called David and told him the whole conversation. He brought him to Saul, and David was with Saul as before. Once more war, bro war broke out, and David went out and fought the Philistines. He struck them with such force that they fled before him. But an evil spirit from Saul, or from the Lord, came upon Saul as he was sitting in his house with his spear in his hand. While David was playing the harp, Saul tried to pin him to the wall with his spear. But David eluded him as Saul drove the spear into the wall. That night, David made good his escape. Saul sent men to David's house to watch it and to kill him in the morning. But Michal, David's wife, warned him, If you don't run for your life tonight, tomorrow you'll be killed. So Michal let David down through a window, and he fled and escaped. Then Michal took an idol and laid it on his bed, covering it with a garment and putting some goat's hair on it at the head. When Saul sent the men to capture David, Michael said, he is ill. Then Saul sent the men back to see David and told them, bring him up to me in his bed so that I may kill him. But when the men entered, there was the, there was the idol in the bed, and at the head was some goat's hair. Saul said to Michael, why did you deceive me like this and send my enemy away so that he escaped? Michael told him, he said to me, let me get away. Why should I kill you? When David had fled and made his escape, he went to Samuel at Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. Then he and Samuel went to Nioth and stayed there. Word came to Saul. David is in Nioth at Ramah. So he sent men to capture him. But when they saw a group of prophets prophesying with Samuel standing there as their leader, the Spirit of God came upon Saul's men, and they also prophesied. Saul was told about it, and he sent more men, and they prophesied too. Saul sent a man, Saul sent men a third time, and they also prophesied prophesied. Finally, he himself left for Ramah and went to the great cistern at Seku, and he asked, where are Samuel and David? Over in Naoth and Ramah, they said. So Saul went to Naoth at Ramah, but the Spirit of God came even upon him, and he walked along prophesying until he came to Naoth. He stripped off his robes and also prophesied in Samuel's presence. He lay that way all that day and night. This is why people say, is Saul also among the prophets? Here ends our reading. Uh, there's a response of thankfulness uh, for us that's uh, printed for us here in our bulletin. The word of the Lord. Thanks, be to God. Thanks indeed. Let's pray. We're in October now. And uh, so I saw something uh, the other day somewhere on social media about can I just celebrate Halloween and Thanksgiving and Christmas all at once, please. 
uh, but we're to October, which is uh, Halloween season. And I remember when I was either in sixth or seventh grade, the movie Halloween came out. And I was too little to go and see this. And besides, I'm not a big uh, uh, horror movie fan. I did see Halloween 3 uh, with a couple of my good friends. And, and uh, there's a scene in that movie where these snakes break out in this venomous snakes break out in this one room. And I also hate snakes in addition to hating horror movies. And my uh, best friend uh, saw how tense I was and he snuck his hand under, as he sat beside me, under my thigh and he grabbed it real fast and I jumped about a foot and a half out of my seat there in the Strand Theater in Delaware, Ohio. <laughs> but the movie Halloween, I was too young to see. My brother and sister went and saw it at that same theater. But you know, if you've seen that classic movie Halloween, Jamie Lee Curtis and whoever else, they paid $3 to be in that movie. Um, that, that the deal is, the, the main character, is that Jason? Jason's Halloween, is that right? Or is that Friday the 13th? Friday the 13th. Friday the 13th? Okay. Whoever the, whoever the guy is, and we don't have any, we need Stuart Mazel here. He's in Tim. Michael Myers. Wow. Yeah, so there we go. So Michael Myers, you know, he gets killed. And he's down there, and of course, nobody runs away. <laughs> Looks dead to me. Good enough for you. Yeah, okay. I'm the only one in the house. Not going to turn on any lights. Not going to run for help. But he goes, and, and he, uh, upon this, um, rises up again. And then they kill him again. And he keeps rising up over and over. And as this, as this occurs, um, there's nothing that, that can be done to stop him. Uh, but one of the things we see here in this passage is this, uh, that David is king. And no matter how many attempts are made upon his life, and we keep seeing these over and over again, uh, no matter how many attempts are made upon his life, um, he's going to be king. No matter what, the Lord's going to protect him. He will rise from whatever assassination or send him into military service plot that Saul uh, brings up for him. He will, he will be king. And, and as you look there in your bulletin, you can see that this is God's, uh, one of God's points for us this morning. If you'd like to fill out blanks in an outline, you're welcome uh, to fill that out. Um, and it's this, that Jesus is God's chosen king. Jesus is God's chosen king and the true king for his people. And in the end, the true king for all the world. Jesus is God's chosen king. And he is the true king for his people. And in the end, true king for all the world. And that's the point as we look here and, and see this contrast between Saul and David. We're told in Scripture that uh, uh, all and Jesus tells us that the law, Moses, the prophets, they all speak of him. And so as we look here and see this passage, we see that this speaks truly of Jesus. Um, David was the true king. Um, Saul was still around. But God's people were to see that it was David chosen to be king. And no matter what Saul did uh, to defeat him, uh, that uh, David, David would be king. Um, all acknowledge this except for Saul. Um, even Jonathan acknowledges this, son of Saul, the one who would have been king had David not been around, the one who would just been the heir. Uh, but as well, uh, Saul's daughter, Michael acknowledges this, that David is the true king, the one who should be followed. So even Saul's kids recognize this. The chief prophet of the day, Samuel, recognizes this. And Samuel had, had uh, anointed David as king in, in chapter 16. And now this uh, acknowledgement continues here in, in chapter 19. Um, and then really the Holy Spirit himself uh, protects David as king. 
uh, David or sorry Saul sends soldiers to capture David so that Saul might kill him and he does this three times and yes this is very reminiscent of uh, Jesus when he talks about uh, sending uh, the, the master who owns the field and he gives the field over to tenants and then at the end of the harvest season he sends a servant uh, to, to, to call and, and to gather uh, the fruit from the field and they kill that servant and then he sends another and sends another and finally he sends his son uh, but Saul does this he sends soldiers group after soldier group three different groups and God the Holy Spirit himself protects David by overcoming these servants of Saul by overcoming these soldiers who were supposed to capture David and bring David back to his death and they can't kill David because they become overtaken by the Holy Spirit and they begin prophesying instead and as they are directed by the Holy Spirit they can't bring David to his death because the Holy Spirit doing the will of the Father in heaven above will not work against the Father and the Father's desire is that David be king over all his people in fact even when Saul comes to kill David himself the Holy Spirit overcomes Saul, and Saul can't overcome David and put him to death. So Samuel and Jonathan and Michael and the Holy Spirit himself all acknowledge that David is the chosen king, the true king for God's people, not Saul, not something else. Uh, so uh, we saw this in what we read at the end of the Gospel of Mark. Uh, as Jesus had uh, come out first of all and said here's the good news chapter 1 here's the good news the kingdom of God is at hand and again as we frequently say Jesus doesn't say here's the good news invite me into your heart and your sins will be forgiven okay that language of inviting Jesus into your heart is foreign to scripture we use it a lot in 20th 21st century Christianity, but it's foreign to Scripture. But the good news Jesus proclaims is that the kingdom of God is here. And, and the good news for that is, is that uh, anyone who is a member of his kingdom is protected by him. We see here in this passage, anyone who comes against God's people, anyone who comes against God's own, David goes out and fights them and defeats them. And God's people are safe because David is in charge because David has been anointed by the Lord to be king and that's true in the church today uh, we're not safe because we've been good we're safe because Jesus is our king because our great enemy Satan who would seek to do us harm has been defeated by Jesus death which would come and overtake us has been defeated by Jesus, the great son of David. And so the good news is that we can be part of this kingdom in which our king is uh, um, defeating, defeating all our enemies. And so when Jesus comes on the scene, he says, here's the good news. You have a kingdom again led by a, a son of David king. And you can be safe from all your enemies through me being your king. Here are the good news. The kingdom of God is at hand. And there, is, as uh, Mark finishes off his gospel, one of the last things that's, that's said about Jesus is Pilate asks this question. Are you king of the Jews? And Jesus says, I am. That's the good news. That's why I've come, to be king, to protect my people as their king, as this warrior king who protects his people against uh, final judgment to come uh, which Satan would want to go not in my way so uh, second line there for, for you in your outline there in fact uh, really really Jesus is king now speaking of Mike Myers really really he says that in Shrek <laughs> in fact really really Jesus is king now and will always be king so we go back to this passage, and, and we can ask the question, what should Saul have done from chapter 16 on? You know, chapter 15, the Lord said through Samuel, God has ripped the kingship from you, and he's going to give it to one of your neighbors, 
someone better than you? What would be your obedient response as Saul? Okay, I've done wrong. Show me this king and I'll follow him. That's what Saul's son does, Jonathan. That's what Saul's daughter does, Michael. Uh, and, and so uh, Saul uh, doesn't do this, however. He opposes this. Uh, he doesn't acknowledge that David now is God's choice for king, and I am no longer God's choice for king. But that's true of Jesus today. Jesus is king now. We read several passages about that this morning. Our call to worship was from that. God gives John the Apostle this scene in which there's this scroll, uh, which later is revealed to be the book of life, and what you see there in that passage in Revelation 5, everybody in heaven there, their souls there, they're a little bit worried and they're stressed out because this book of life is sealed with seven seals, and nobody is worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. And we find out in Revelation 20 that our spending eternity with Jesus in the new heavens and new earth is based on whether our names are in the book of life, this scroll with seven seals, or whether we're judged by everything that's recorded in the books of the deeds that we've done in our lives. And if we are at final judgment and we are judged based on the deeds we do in our lives, there is no hope for blessedness in, in eternity. In fact, it says there that we will be cast into the lake of fire and we will get what our sins deserve. God is fair and God is just. But in Revelation 20, there that scene of final judgment, if our names are in the, the book of life, then our name is just read. You're included. You're in the club. You're one for whom Jesus died. And we go on into the new heavens and the new earth, not because of things we've done, but because our name is on the, the, Lamb's, the Lamb's book of life. But back in Revelation 5, we saw the scene when Jesus was on the earth and he was not there and the Father's there on his throne. But all those Old Testament saints are there along with the angels and they're stressed because they know final judgment is coming like all people do. All people feel guilty and nervous about death. They feel guilty when they commit sins because they know apart from any solution to this, I'll be judged by the books that record every thought, word, and deed that I've ever done. And so they're stressed and they say, Who, who's worthy? There's no one worthy here to take the scroll and to open its seals. But then who arrives there in Revelation 5? Ascended from his time there on the earth, those 30, 33 years. Jesus arrives back into heaven. And John describes Jesus as a lamb looking as if he had been slain. Jesus is coming from the cross. And heaven rejoices because, they, because Jesus is worthy to take the scroll. Why is Jesus worthy to take the scroll? Well, they say it in their song, don't they? You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you have purchased men for God with your own blood. See, the price for that scroll was blood. The price for that scroll was payment for all the sins of all God's people. And nobody had done that. So nobody could take the scroll and open its seals. Nobody had bought, nobody had the money, the purchase price, to take the scroll and to open its seals. But Jesus arrives, and he's been slain, and he has purchased us on the cross. And so he comes into heaven, and heaven rejoices because now they know my name can be read. Because the scroll will be able to be opened because Jesus has with his blood bought this scroll, and he is worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. And when final judgment comes, he can just see my name there that he has, and, and he's purchased me with his blood. So that's good news. Jesus is king now. He's arrived in heaven. And then we saw in our declaration of the gospel, what happens when Jesus gets in heaven? Well, look at verse 3 there, the very bottom on your front page of the bulletin there. I'll look there too. That'll give you time to flip your page. That last sentence. 
Jesus comes to the earth, last sentence there, after he had provided purification for sins. That's Jesus on the cross, providing his blood to cover our transgressions. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down, Revelation 5. He arrives in heaven, takes the scroll, and he sits down. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Jesus went back, after he made purification for sins, he went back into heaven, took that scroll, and he sat, and he sat down. So Jesus is now king. Now he's not everybody's king. Right now, he's king of all those who have bowed their knee to him as king. Who have said, Jesus, I need you to be my king. Like if we were there when Jesus is proclaiming this in Mark 1, hear the good news, the kingdom of God is here. And we said, Jesus, great. You're the son of David. We want you to be our king. And that's what happens when people believe in Jesus. They've, in essence, bowed their knee. They've, in essence, bowed their knee to be a, uh, they bowed their knee um, to have Jesus be their king. And so now Jesus is their king, and he is protecting them. Uh, but not only is Jesus king now, reigning in heaven above, the book of Revelation shows us this over and over, and, and uh, uh, Paul, uh, Paul says this at the end of 1 Timothy, uh, the, now to the king eternal, who lives in everlasting light. This is speaking of Jesus. But Jesus will be king always. He'll be king always. Um, it, it's very uh, interesting. We, we read um, there in Luke 19, um, Jesus gives all these parables, and they're generally parables about God sends, God the Father sends Jesus to the earth. He gets rejected, um, but he, he goes back up to heaven. Uh, but Luke 19, 15, that Bob read for us, um, the, the uh, a king goes away, a uh, man of noble birth went to a distant country. This is Jesus going to the earth. A king of noble birth comes to a distant, goes to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. So he called 10 of his servants to give them 10 minas, put this money to work, he said, until I come back. But his subjects hated him. Who were God's subjects? The, the Jews, God's people, when Jesus was incarnate, when he came to this earth. His subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, we don't want this man to be our king. See, Jesus would see this happen to him uh, before Pilate. Um, what do you, Pilate literally asked the Jews, what do you want me to do with your king? And they respond back to him in, in John 19, we have no king but Caesar. We don't want this man, Jesus, to be our king. But Jesus continues here in the parable and says, verse 15, he was made king, however, <laughs> and returned home. This is David, right, here in this passage in chapter 19. David's, no matter what Saul says, Saul says, I don't want this man to be my king. But David was made king, however. And that's a truth for us, whether we be a Christian today or a non-Christian, that Jesus is king now. He's reigning in heaven above over his people, over all who are in his kingdom the church and those who have died uh, believing he's king over them but one day he will be king over all over all um, so number two that brings us to number two so in view of the fact that Jesus is God's chosen king he's true king for his people and true king for everybody at the last day um, number two how do we respond don't oppose Jesus kingship uh, in other words, as Jesus said, I'm going to be made king anyway. <laughs> he says in his day, before he ascends up to the right hand of his father in his ascension, he says, you know what? I'm this man of noble birth, and even though you say you don't want me to be your king, the father is going to make me king anyway. I will sit at his right hand on the throne. And, and that's, that's the deal here. And uh, Saul tries to oppose David as king in verse 1. 
In verses 9 through 24, all these verses are Saul opposing, Saul opposing uh, David as king. Now the question is, A, for our day, for our day, how? We're going to talk about how. How you might, how I might oppose, how you and I might oppose Jesus' kingship. So, number one. Um, for us, it's not like Saul. For Saul opposing David's kingship, it, a lot of it was um, political, uh, social, physical, physical kind of stuff. But for us, it's an, it's an opposition of head and heart and mind and will. Okay? For us, to oppose the kingship of Jesus is to re rebel against his will for us. And it's something that goes on in our head our, our head and our heart, our, our minds, our wills. Okay? Um, so two, two ways this occurs today, opposition to the kingship of Jesus. And, and uh, we're going to talk about Christians first. And that's, that's your blank there in that number two. For Christians, Christians can oppose the kingship of Jesus. I do this every day. I oppose the kingship of Jesus over me. And so here's your number two. For Christians, it's a matter of doing my own will, doing my own thing without seeking direction from Jesus. For Christians, if you're here today and you're a Christian, um, opposition to Jesus' kingship is a matter of doing your own thing without seeking direction from Jesus. I'm going to live my life, but I'm not going to ask Jesus how I should live it. I kind of know what Jesus might say here that I should do, but I don't want to do that, so I'm not going to look. Okay? And, and that's what I do every time I sin. Every time I, time I sin, I am opposing the kingship of Jesus over my life. I'm saying, Jesus, you're king, but not here. Not here. Um, it may be I know God's will and his commands, and I just refuse to obey them, or maybe it's just I don't know his commands well enough. Uh, so number so a there as a Christian know that Jesus is your king you're a citizen in his kingdom you're a citizen in his kingdom uh, the kingdom of God the kingdom of Christ uh, we're called in Philippians 320 citizens of heaven okay Jesus is in heaven he's king uh, uh, they're reigning from heaven and we're citizens of his kingdom um, and he calls the shots He's the king. So he calls the shots, and he sets the allowable and disallowable behavior in his kingdom. Okay, so we're members of his kingdom, whether we're here gathered together in his kingdom of the church, but we're still citizens of his kingdom when we go out into the world in our jobs each day. Right? Just like if you can be a citizen of the United States, but you can travel to France. It just means you're not living in the kingdom right now but you're still a citizen of the United States. Okay? Same thing for us as believers. We're citizens of, of Jesus' kingdom, and he is king. And here we gather, and we're kind of living in our homeland as we come to church on Sunday mornings. But when we go out in the world, we're still citizens of the kingdom. And we're, we're still uh, uh, following the desire and the, the will of our king. Um, he is the one who calls the shots on what's allowable and disallowable behavior in his kingdom. And so B, this means for you, uh, this means for you, your reading and being taught in the Bible. You know, uh, if uh, you, you murder, um, I, the excuse, I didn't know murder is illegal, to take a variance of an old Steve Martin joke, that does not get you out of the uh, judgment of murderer. Okay? If you're caught and you're on videotape and you go to trial, uh, the defense, I didn't know murder was illegal, um, won't work. And, and so we as believers, as we grow in our, our, our Christ-likeness, as we grow in our maturity in Christ, we want to take in, we want to read God's Word, the Bible. We want to be taught in God's Word, the Bible, so that we know not to do this, so that we know to do this instead, so that we can have our lives be in conformity with our King's will, with what our King, Jesus, has decreed 
uh, for us to do uh, so that we know what his will or his laws are for my life. Um, when we say, what's God's will for our lives? Uh, most of that's written in the scriptures for us. Now, it doesn't say whether you should take job A or B, but, but the, the commands of God which govern our behavior can help determine which of those jobs might be better for you to take. Okay. Uh, now, three, for non-Christians. Uh, so Christians can, can rebel against the kingship of Jesus or oppose the king, kingship of Jesus in their lives in day-to-day -day life as they do their own thing without looking to Jesus for direction. But non-Christians, for non-Christians, opposition can take many forms. It can be, uh, A, internal suppression, suppression of the truth um, that we know to be true about the existence of God and our own sin. And Paul talks about this in Romans 1 and, and Romans 2, um, that, that we know, Paul says to us, that God exists. Every human being knows that, Christian or non-Christian, knows that God exists. That's inbuilt into the human frame. And he knows that, that he is to love God and love neighbor. Paul says the law of God is written even on the Gentile's heart, Paul says. The Jews have the law of God written out for them in Moses, Paul says there. But Gentiles who don't have the law of Moses have the law of God written on their hearts. And this is why he says in Romans 1 and 2, everybody feels, feels guilty when they sin. This is why our consciences bother us. And Paul puts it in this way. He says our consciences are either accusing us or defending us with any action we do. And when I do something loving to my neighbor, my conscience defends me and pats me on the back and says, that was good and right to do, even for the non-believer. He doesn't have guilt as he does what's nice and good and merciful to his neighbor. But when the non-believer does what's wrong, he feels guilt. When we as Christians do what's wrong, we feel guilt. Why, Paul says, because the law of God is written on our, on our hearts. And we also know that judgment is coming. And that if we are judged, again, according to the books of what's written, uh, of what everything we've done and said and thought, that we're in trouble. And this is why the writer of Hebrews says in, in, in Hebrews chapter 2, that we all spend our whole lives fearing death apart from the gospel. Apart from the gospel, we fear death because we know, because the law of God's written in our heart, we haven't obeyed it, and we won't survive judgment. And so uh, a non-Christian means of, of dealing with that, the fear of death and judgment to come, and that we owe God obedience and love to our neighbor, the, the, the natural response to that is to suppress that truth, to suppress that truth. Or B, um, we can oppose the kingship of Jesus by choosing other kings. And that can be a non-Christian uh, non uh, philosophy or non-biblical philosophy of life. Here's some, and it, it doesn't have to be like um, existentialism or, or, or uh, uh, some kind of Neoplatonism or something like that, something fancy in terms of a philosophy of life. It can be these things that we hear constantly. To be true to yourself. That's a philosophy of life. It's not in the Bible. Um, be a good guy. You know, I just, that's my goal. I want to be a good guy. People, people say, man, you, oh yeah, you know, Kirk, he's a good guy. Kirk is a good guy. He's a miserable sinner like me who's saved by the mercy of Jesus. But anyway, that, that can be a whole philosophy of life. You know, I was in a fraternity. Everyone wanted to be a good guy. Oh, man, he's, all, he's a good guy. Um, it can be be a stand-up guy. I don't know what that term means, but I've heard it enough. That can be a philosophy of life. If anyone knows, they can tell me after the service. Um, be true to your word. Uh, or uh, if you're back around in the 70s, Look out for number one. That's a philosophy of life. That's the New York Times bestseller. Uh, several years, look out for number one. Uh, this philosophy of life can be always work hard. Philosophy of life can be don't take life too seriously. Philosophy of life can be uh, don't trust authorities. Philosophy of life can be don't take yourself too seriously. Hey, we've all heard these expressions. Those are philosophies of life um, that, that don't come out of Scripture. Um, there can be a philosophy of life that some people will admit 
um, make as much money as you can. Some people's philosophy of life is get the biggest house and the nicest cars that you can. Um, and, and really, you know, a lot of people are living by that philosophy of life. There can be a philosophy of life of it's my goal in life is to have, have the highest position in my company that I, I can possibly have by the time I retire. Um, that can be a philosophy of life. Um, climb the corporate ladder. Um, philosophy of life, do what you need to win the respect of others. Or how about this one? Don't make waves. That, for some, that's a philosophy of life. Don't make waves. Um, for some, it's always make waves. <laughs> Confront everybody. Um, some, it's get in touch with the universe. Okay, so a little bit more in the, the new age and pantheism, that kind of thing. Um, some people, it's, it's seek moderation. Everything in moderation, that's what I say. That's a philosophy of life. Okay. Um, seek pleasure and get as much pleasure as you can. Okay, hedonism is what that's called classically. Um, or um, there's a, here's a good one if you live in Ohio, root for the Ohio State Buckeyes. That's a philosophy of life. Get the gear, go to the games, participate in social media, and have your mood affected by how well they played on Saturday. That's a philosophy of life, and you can just insert your own team there. And so those can be other kings, things that direct what we do, say, and how we think, and how our mood is affected. Those are other kings that we can choose to distract us from the one true king, Jesus. Here's another way, uh, C. Uh, it can be by choosing another religion. Um, I think Buddhism is cool. Okay? I don't. Um, but that, that, you know, actually choosing another religion, that's choosing another king, another uh, a guide uh, system. And I learned in the midst of this that it's um, cho uh, what? losing my religion, R.E.M. They've had that, I always thought that it was choosing my religion back in 98 or 99 when that song was out, but I looked it up. Um, here's another way, D. Um, this is, this is uh, uh, sometimes a, a great occurrence. Bold professions of disbelief in God. Bold professions of disbelief that Jesus is the only way to God and, and only way to heaven and a blessed afterlife. And, and a, a lot of times this is the, actually the last thing going on before somebody believes in Jesus. So if you know somebody, I mean, this is Saul, Saul of Tarsus. You know, this this vehement, angry disbelief sometimes can be the last straw. It's when someone has, else has nothing else to cling to other than anger uh, against the one true king. And, and, and oftentimes it can be the, the person himself trying to convince himself through speaking loudly to himself that Jesus isn't king, that God doesn't exist. That that's foolishness. Oh, I don't believe in any of, any of that stuff, that religion stuff. Okay? So that can be a way non-Christians uh, oppose the kingship of Jesus. Bold professions of disbelief. And then there's the easy one, E, cynicism. Now, that's a funny word. It's C-Y-N-I-C, -I -C, cynic. Uh, cynicism. Um, this often is, done, this is what I call NPR culture or university culture, cynicism. Oh, that's what they traditionally believe. Ha, ha, ha. With no substitute philosophy. Nothing in its place. Just a scorning of something by virtue of the fact that people have agreed with this in the past. Oh, in the past, people have said 2 plus 2 equals 4. <laughs> Isn't that foolish? Well, what do you think it equals? I've got four objects here. Let's count. Oh, well, we don't want to count. Right? Cynicism. Not the, oh, nothing out there. You know, that's easy. That's cheap intellectualism. That's poser intellectualism. That's intellectualism without the guts to make a decision based on the facts that are before you. That's cowardice. Okay? And, and, and the church, both from within and from without, loses people to this. This... Uh, cynicism or this false intellectualism that says 
it's more intellectual to ask a question than to answer it. One of the th good, you're laughing. One of the things I've enjoyed about having uh, Tessa uh, be at NC State, our first daughter at NC State, is they picked up a theme three years ago and they meant it to be for one year. And they liked it so much, they've just kept it. And the, the, the slogan is think and do. And I thought, that's a real um, engineering school, and 50% of the students are engineers. That's a real engineering school kind of slogan. Think and do. Can you imagine if the people at NC State dealt with things like people at Carolina and Duke, I'm poking fun at myself here, I have a daughter who went to Duke, who just throw out philosophy there and say, this is true. We haven't tested it. We're not going to test it. But it's true. And anyone else who disagrees with us, <laughs> aren't they simple? Can you imagine if your NC State graduate bridge builder just throws out philosophy and doesn't test it? That's a bridge I do not want to be on, <laughs> right? Now, that's not saying anyone who goes to any other school at NC State or you know that kind of thing. It's a bad person or anything. It's just, it's just that we want to be wary of, of philosophies that are just out there that aren't proven. And, and what happens with these disproven philosophies, and I, I bring up to you often, you know, in the early 70s, the, the idea of open marriage. An open marriage was that you could be married, but you, both spouses could date other people and be adulterous with other people, even, you know, beyond just the, the dating and going to movies and that kind of thing with other people who weren't their spouses. And you know what, this is categorically rejected, but nobody who came up with open marriage when they came up with the new philosophy said, we were wrong. We've tested this now for 15 years, and it's led to utter destruction in marriages and with kids and in households, and kids are really screwed up today because their parents weren't taught, be faithful to each other. Look nowhere else but to each other for your fulfillment in relationship, okay? Uh, and, and so, but these are other things that get, can be opposition to the kingship, uh, the, to the kingship of Jesus. So that's, that's how, that's how we can be uh, opposed to the kingship of Jesus. Now, be why. Why not, why not, or why it's not smart, why it's not smart or best for you to oppose Jesus' kingship. One, because Jesus is now and always will be king. Okay, we've mentioned that before, but that is just, it, it is a fact. Jesus is now and always will be king. Uh, and so nothing you, I, nothing you do, or you can put I in there, nothing I do will change that. Um, Saul in 18.4 or 19.24, nothing he does. Nothing Saul does will change the fact that David will be king and that God will always, God the Father will always keep David as king. God the Father will always, he's made Jesus king. Jesus is God's choice to be king and Jesus will always be king. And nothing we do, no opposition to his kingship will change it. Like that parable Jesus told in Luke 19. The people can say, we don't want him to be our king. And God says, well, it's not up to you. And Jesus is made king anyway. Or if you're a, 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 we talk about Lion King in Sunday school, if you're a Mulan fan. Anyone seen Mulan? That's another great movie. <laughs> We're just walking up the progression of my kid's childhood here. <laughs> in, in, in Mulan, there's a scene where these soldiers go to, to, uh, to bathe in the, the pond or the river or the lake, and, and Yao uh, gets up on a character, gets up on this rock and says, I'm king of the rock and there's nothing you girls can do about it. You know, it's basically king of the hill. And, and that's the situation with Jesus, although it's not given to us necessarily as a threat, but Jesus is king. And, and our disbelief doesn't do anything to that. Our belief doesn't do anything to that. Jesus is king whether nobody ever believed or not, because God the Father anointed Jesus to be king. Um, or for those of you who are Star Wars fans, at the end of The Empire Strikes Back, you know, Darth Vader has, has Luke on that, 
that precipice on that that hallway with the railings on both sides right before he tells Luke I I am your father he he says these words it is useless to resist and that's the case with Jesus being king. it's useless it just has no use uh, we either admit it now or we find out later that Jesus is, Jesus is king. Um, chapter 18, verse 4, and then chapter 19, verse 4. Look at those two passages there, those two verses. Chap verse 4 of chapter 18 and, and chapter 19. There's a symbolic, sim uh, symbol, uh, symbolic symbolism. How about that? Um, there's a symbolism here going on uh, with this passage. A king's robes indicated he was king. We see this in the mockery of Jesus by the soldiers. What do they do to mock him as king? They put a robe on him and a crown. And they give him a, a stick and, as a scepter. And they, they mock him and they say, Hail, king of the Jews. Well, this is going on here, not in a mocking way. But we see that Jonathan himself takes off his own robe in 18.4. And he gives it this symbolic action. He says, I will not be king. David, you've been anointed king. Chapter 16. David, you've been anointed king. And he, he gives to David his robe and his sword. He gives him these symbols of the heir to the throne. Jonathan does. It goes to David. And then even when Saul comes in, in, in chapter, uh, chapter 19, um, that should be 24, sorry. In 1924, uh, Saul comes, and, and what's he do? He takes off his king's robe. Um, in the presence of David, in the presence of the one who has anointed David to be king, Samuel, uh, Saul has to admit the truth. When he stands before the king and his anointer, actually he's flattened down on the ground, and his robe is now off. He has to admit I'm not the king. I'm not the king. There is, there is another. So too, it's not smart to resist the kingship of Jesus, not only because nothing we do, no disbelief or belief will change that, but because to do so, to, to ignore the kingship of Jesus, to rebel against that, is just to lead to frustration for us. Just to lead to frustration for us. Um, Saul, uh, chapter 18, verses 10 and 11, he tries to spear David back then, and he doesn't. He's like me trying to shoot squirrels. It's like I, I probably tried to shoot squirrels about three years ago, 120 times, and I shot three of them. <laughs> Utter frustration. Those guys are fast, man. They hear that little thing. You know, they're, they don't seem fast when they're in your, your yard, but when you're trying to shoot them, man, they hear something, and they're zoom. They're off. Faith Patterson can shoot him. I can't. Well, that's true. Um, but but it, it's just, it, it's frustration. And then get the frustration, get the dramatic comedy of chapter 19. Saul's been trying to kill David over and over. First with a spear, then by sending him out in battle after battle with the Philistines. And he says literally in chapter 18, I'll send him out in the front of the Philistines and the Philistines will kill him for me. Frustration. And then he gets to this, he, so he tells his advisors, hey, everybody, we're killing David. We're all in, right? Kill David, right? We're in. And he gets frustrated because Jonathan comes to him and says, why do you want to do this? David's done nothing good to you but this. And Saul says, okay, yeah. But then a battle arises again, and, and David goes out and fights these Philistines, and then Saul gets jealous again, and Saul wants to kill David again. And so then... Saul's soldiers, he sends to David's house. What's that lead to? Frustration. And then he finds out that his own daughter has been the source of this. So he's frustrated that his advisors don't follow him, his son doesn't follow him, then his daughter doesn't follow him. His soldiers are uh, um, unsuccessful when they go to David's house because David's already escaped. He's frustrated when the bed gets brought to him and it's not David on the bed, but it's um, uh, uh, Clint Eastwood's doll, right, and, and Escape from Alcatraz there underneath the blanket, or uh, um, what's the other movie Ferris with Bueller. Ferris Bueller? Okay, <laughs> Ferris Bueller. We got um, um, anyway uh, the the uh, uh, 
Shawshank Redemption, you know, all this kind of thing. And, and so Saul's frustrated. It's like, you know, it's, it's one of those Job from uh, Arrested Developments. Come on! You know, I mean, time after time, this just doesn't work out for him. Then he sends his soldiers to get David, and they don't come back. They join in with them, and they're prophesying. Come on! He sends out another group, a second group. Come on! He sends out a third group. Come on! And then he goes, well, if I want to do it, I'm going to do it myself. And he can't do it himself. It's utter frustration. This is funny. And you could, you could do chapter 19 as a play and make it a comedy. This is funny stuff. This is frustration. But this is a message for us, too. If you think, if you're, if you're one of the Israelites getting the books, uh, First and Second Samuel, hot off the press, and you're part of northern Israel who has not chosen one of the son of, sons of David to be your king, you say, you know what? I think this is going to lead to frustration for us to not have a son of David be our king. It sure led to a lot of frustration for Saul. And so that's the big message. That's the big message for us, uh, the big message of this, uh, this text, that, that not having the son of David, Jesus, as your king is going to mean a lot of frustration for you. Um, so a few things quickly about this. As a Christian, again, as a Christian, how will this how will this lead to frustration? As a Christian, fighting against Jesus' kingship over you leads to the frustration of his discipline. We read about his discipline in Hebrews chapter 12. Okay, If we don't follow in the Lord's ways, the Father loves us. And what loving Father doesn't discipline his child? And if the Father in heaven above sees us walking not in his ways, he knows this is going to not be to our good. And so he disciplines us to teach us his ways so that we can in the future then walk in his blessing. But that's frustrating to experience his discipline. While on the other hand, next line for you, while submission as a believer, submission to his kingship leads to current and eternal blessing. In Hebrews 12, 11, which Bob read for us, it says, as we walk in his ways, as we learn from God's discipline, from the discipline of his word, which instructs us, from the discipline that occurs in our lives when we walk outside of his word and it doesn't work out so well, when we're disciplined by this, it leads to what uh, Paul calls the, the peaceful fruit of righteousness joy and peace in the Holy Spirit, this peaceful fruit of righteousness. There's peace and joy that occurs in our souls as we don't rebel against Jesus' kingship, as we walk along in life with, with the son of David as our king. And then, then number four, as a non-Christian, as a non-Christian, frustration comes in two. Ignoring that Jesus is king leads to the frustration of A, living a life in a way you're not framed to endure. And we read this in, in our uh, preparation for hearing God's word, those Proverbs verses. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. And, and, and that's slightly, it doesn't mean that if you walk in the Lord's ways, you won't get cancer. It doesn't mean that. But it means you'll have health. You'll have your, your soul, your, your experience on earth will be good and, and healthy and satisfying for you. Further, he says there, um, he who scorns instruction will pay for it. You know, I, some of you know the story. When I was, Betsy and I were back at my, my home at a conference in Columbus, Ohio. My parents lived not too far from Columbus, Ohio. And we were about 28 years old, no, about 24 years old. And so we stayed with my parents at night and said, living in the hotel where the conference was. It was a training conference. And it was bitter cold in the end of in the January. And my dad spent all this time, and he cleared out this a part of the garage so I, we could park our, our our car in the garage. He said, and he said to me that night before the heading out in the morning, he said, John, go ahead, go out and get pull your car into the garage. It's going to be really cold tonight. And I said, Oh no, Dad, I didn't want to put my shoes on or whatever, or go out into the cold. I said, I'll just. I'll just scrape the ice off or the snow off in the morning. I'll be okay. He says, no, John, go ahead. Get I cleared out the garage before you go put the car in there. So I, I didn't do it. I, I scorned his instruction. Okay? And so I get in the car the next day, and I'm going down, and, and, and I get about 20 minutes away, and I know that there's no heat in the car yet. And I look at the little heat meter, you know, the meter that you say, what's that there for in your car? And it was still down on absolute cold there. And then I get down, I'm on Old Tangy River Road in, in Columbus, Ohio, there on 315, just south of where Laura Bradford was born. And 
boom, there's this sound, and all this steam comes out from under my hood. And what had happened was the thermostat was frozen shut. The thermostat in your car, I know now, <laughs> is what causes the hot water that goes through your engine, you know, the antifreeze and water and all that, and it cools your engine down and keeps your engine down. It's also what heats your car. So if you're ever out in frozen cold and your car's not heating up, it means your thermostat is stuck. And what that meant was no, no cooling water was going through my engine. And so my engine essentially got melted. And it finally the pressure built up so much that the, the little uh, 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 flexible piping that goes, uh, that goes into your engine and all that kind of thing just exploded. And, and that was all the steam that I saw there uh, on the car. I scorned instruction and I paid for it. And actually, my dad and Betsy's dad paid for it because we didn't have any money at that time. It was thousands of dollars. <laughs> uh, but, but, but living a life in a way that Jesus doesn't direct is to live a life that's not how we were framed to live as human beings. Second thing, be there. Uh, it, it also, uh, as a non-Christian, ignoring that Jesus is king leads to everlasting judgment at the last day. Uh, again, uh, the end of the quote from D Darth Vader, it is useless to resist. He says, don't let yourself be destroyed as Obi-Wan did. All right? But that's the thing with the kingship of Jesus. Um, Jesus is, is, is offering to us eternal life. He is king whether we take hold of that or not. And he wants us to take hold of that, that we might experience the benefits of, of his kingship. So one thing, number one there, one of the functions of the king in the Old Testament that we see in the functions of kings all throughout ancient history is that the king was the final judge. The king was the Supreme Court. And we see this like with Solomon when he makes that judgment between the, the two prostitutes who both have babies and one baby dies and, and Solomon says, okay, cut the baby in half and you can both have half. This was Solomon acting in his daily duties or weekly duties as, as final judge. And this is true of Jesus as king as well. Jesus is this final judge, and we see that in Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15. And so Jesus, number two there, Jesus has this role too. He's also king who is final judge. And those passages there talk about that. And so Philippians 2 says that God, Jesus has been raised up to the right hand of God, and he is, has sit, sat down as king. And one day, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord and Lord is just a synonym for king okay if you have a king you say yes my Lord right um, and, and so it's it's acknowledging his kingship now or, or later and it's frustrating now if we don't acknowledge his kingship because we live with frustration in our lives because we're putting diesel engine in a gasoline or diesel fuel in a gasoline engine and there's a lot of clunking that goes around with that but it's also then frustrating when we get to the end and we say Jesus was king and now my eternity will, will bear out the results of this so summary summary um, there's peace that's your blank uh, peace to your soul and blessing upon you now and eternally um, and it's not dependent upon how good you are it's dependent on whether you have Jesus as your king and that was the choice for God's people is David going to be our king and we live without this frustration this protection over death in our lives or is somebody else going to be king and frustration will will uh, live and, and, and be with us. Let's pray.